we're going to now, as the staff is arranging the stage, we're going to have a fireside chat. We're going to hear from David Siegel and our, our Dean Dan Huttenlocker. You guys can make your way up in a moment. I'm going to say a few words here while they're arranging chairs. Apologize for the commotion. Um, Dean Huttenlocker is, um, D Dan is the Dean of the Schwarzman College of Computing. He is the inaugural Dean of this College of Computing. Um, and uh, he may say, say a few words about that in his discussion. Um, and he's also the Henry Ellis Warren Professor of Computer Science and AI and Decision Making, which sits in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. Dan is also an MIT alum. He received his master's and doctorate from MIT. And, and so that's, that's Dan. Then we have David Siegel joining him for the fireside chat. David Siegel, for those of you who don't know, is actually a computer scientist. He's an entrepreneur and a philanthropist. David is the co-founder of Two Sigma which drives transformation across the financial service industry and investment management, venture, venture capital, private equity, and real estate. And David founded the Siegel Family Endowment in 2011 to support organizations and leaders that will understand and shape the impact of technology on society. David is a member of the MIT Executive Committee of the MIT Corporation and is a good friend of what was CBM, M, which is now The Quest. And the Siegel Family Endowment support in 2018 laid the foundation to allow a lot of our ideas to become real, leading to some of the work that you've seen today. We are so grateful for the Siegel Family's endowment and recent, recent transformational gift to name the uh, Quest for Intelligence. And Dan Hotlocker's leadership and support for our vision has provided us with the space to grow and innovate. As I mentioned, our headquarters in this building on the third floor. Dan and David, we look forward to hearing your thoughts about our field and what the future might hold. Let's give them a warm round of applause. Yep. Hey, everyone. Um, great to be here with you. Particularly great to be here with David. Uh, let, me, let me maybe get us kicked off with a, a discussion topic. Um, so David, I'm, I'm very interested in, I mean, I've, I've seen this, we've had discussions about it, but I think for the group at large, like what, what draws you to this vision of understanding intelligence by studying both human and machine intelligence, this interrelated problem? It's something that has a long history at MIT, certainly is you know, foundational to CBMM and then to the Quest. Um, what, what, what has gotten you involved in thinking about that? You know, maybe way before CBMM and the Quest, but certainly as part of the activities of of, of these uh, MIT organizations and projects. Well, when you uh, think about uh, the human mind, uh, in some sense, it may be the most uh, complex. Uh, uh, physical system in the universe. And I've, I've always been puzzled uh, by the fact that, uh, you know, in general, people haven't shown that much interest in how it works. Uh, people have been very interested in the origins of the universe, uh, uh, deep space exploration, all that stuff is fantastic. But, uh, you know, people have taken the mind, uh, most people take the mind for, for granted even though, uh, uh, you know, it is something that uh, we don't really understand. And so I've always found that to just be a very interesting problem, basic research, a scientific curiosity-driven uh, interest. And it uh, doesn't matter if they're practical applications or not, we should just understand how it works. And, you know, there will be practical applications, but even if there weren't, it's a very interesting problem. And at the same time, uh, to understand how to build uh, AI-like uh, capabilities is, in a sense, a separate problem, which is also equally interesting. Over time, it became, I think, apparent to me that these should converge. Uh, and the convergence of the two uh, can uh, accelerate progress in, in both areas. And, and so I, I uh, you know, I've, right even from the days that I was at the AI lab at MIT, I was there from 83 to 91, people really did think that way. Maybe not everyone there, but that was already, uh, you know, I'm not going to take credit for the thinking I just shared with you. I, those were ideas that people at the AI lab had, you know, back in 1983 when I got there, and, and I'm sure before. 
So um, maybe uh, since, since you mentioned uh, <laughs> the development of AI, <laughs> uh, you know, we're in this age of sort of just, you know, unbelievably rapid commercial development of AI. And uh, so first, you know, what do you think uh, sort of more fundamental understanding of intelligence might bring to AI? I think many in industry might say, let's just keep scaling, don't need anything else. Uh, so how do, how do you think about that? Well, uh, I think we just, in general, we don't know. I, I think that um, it, it's possible that uh, the breakthroughs that are, are being uh, commercialized and the scaling laws that people, some people believe in will prove to uh, take us to ever greater heights. But uh, it's also quite possible that we're going to run into uh, diminishing returns. The approaches may not be uh, computationally efficient. Uh, we may have completely missed the mark on uh, what it really means to be building an intelligent uh, system. What I think is very interesting today is that um, you, you really no one can agree. Uh, uh, you know, no one can really agree how intelligent, uh, uh, you, you know, the various uh, uh, AI commercial models are. You get incredible debate. Uh, and the fact that no one can agree, I think, is one of the reasons why something like the Quest is so important. <laughs> yep. Um, couldn't agree more. <laughs> we can agree on that. <laughs> on that. Uh, uh, look, one thing I'll, I'll add, and you know, this has been brought up today. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, uh, you know, we were talking about it in the morning. Um, uh, even if the current approaches, uh, you know, will continue to scale, um, this would be as if in the early days of computing, uh, uh, perhaps uh, someone invented a bubble sort, bubble sort for sorting numbers. Okay, an n squared algorithm, and. And then uh, the tech companies at the time decided they were going to build vast data centers to uh, uh, sort numbers and not bother to figure out that there's an n log n way of doing it. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, so a broader question around AI in universities for a minute. I'll diverge a little bit from the... Uh, from the quest uh, for a moment and then come back, or maybe this will lead us back naturally. Uh, so what's the role of universities in this age where, and you sort of answered that a little bit um, with the bubble sort example, but, but what's the role of universities uh, versus, you know, the kinds of work that's going on at companies? But, you know, in, particularly, in particular, how do you see knowledge creation and dissemination changing in an AI age? Uh, how can universities really be driving that? Sort of, you know, how discovery happens, how curiosity-driven research happens. Uh, what, what do you see as the change in that landscape and, and presumably the role for universities in doing that? You know, certainly some of our friends in the, in the Valley uh, who, you know, tend to have large financial stakes in these companies, uh, you know, say, well, you know, <laughs> universities are getting less relevant because we're just going to scale this AI and it's going to, you know, <laughs> do do a better job of research and of education than you all do. Uh, I, I doubt you believe that. So what do you think we should be doing? Well, I, I, I think uh, uh, I'll, I'll state the obvious. The, 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 the role of, uh, of the tech companies is uh, primarily to uh, create shareholder value. These are companies, and they have an obligation to do this to you know, their investors and, and so on. And, uh, and uh, right now, uh, you know, look, in a way, it's really good. They have a lot of money that is uh, available to them that, uh, in part, has been generated by um, you know, a lot of optimism that they've created in part by a good job of, of marketing what, what ideas they have. And this is driving uh, uh, a certain kind of corporate research. But everyone has to remember that uh, their primary objective is, is not to, uh, is, is to, you know, to 
keep their stock prices high and so forth. That's what they're doing. And, uh, you know, that's, that's great. And, you know, you know, they should do that. Now, at a university, we're here to basically come up with the new ideas. We're, we're here to, uh, you know, we're not worrying about, you know, uh, you know, the share of price of MIT. Um, you know, we have a different uh, utility function, uh, you know, entirely different. Um, the companies uh, have gotten themselves, I think, into a little bit of a bind because they did such a great job of uh, promoting their AI vision that uh, now there are, you know, are really big expectations for the amount of money they can make uh, quickly to continue to you know, support their, uh, 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 you know, the kind of uh, ambitions that they've convinced the world are within reach. And so that is creating a bit of a monoculture where they're investing very, very, very heavily on things that they believe over the short term are going to deliver pretty good commercial results. And that may have very little to do with uh, long-term objectives that you, you heard about today, uh, for example, at uh, the Quest. Uh, it may not in advance the field of, of AI and intelligence as much as people think. How do you get the word out about that? Uh, well, to me, it's, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you know, I think it's, it's actually pretty much common sense, but um, uh, because, right, what do companies do? That's what they do. Uh, and what do universities do? That's what, what we do. Yep. Well, you've been a big advocate, uh, I think, in getting the word out in general about the role of universities and supporting research, uh, basic research at universities. Um, well, one of the, one of my thoughts on that uh, is that uh, I you know I I'm not sure it's such a great idea for universities to describe the purpose of their research uh, as uh, uh, you know to cre to to create commercial opportunity um, because right I don't think of basic re basic research which is I think fundamentally what a place like MIT does. Um, is very likely to generate uh, short, medium, and long-term commercial opportunity, but it's not exactly why we're doing it. Um, you know, we're we're doing it because for the pursuit of knowledge, and you know, this is foundational knowledge that will drive everything forward. And if we talk, you know, people probably in this room will disagree with me. Some people, but if we talk too much about how the work that we're doing, for example, at the Quest is going to, for example. Uh, you, you know, lead to, uh, you know, better results for, you know, the big tech industry and, and things like that, then people might start to debate you as to, well, is MIT the best place to do this kind of work? So, you know, I really think we should be very proud about our, our you know, our mission to focus on, on basic research and the pursuit of science. Uh, you know, the fact that uh, universities have been doing this for a long time and the results have been phenomenal, uh, you know, I can't, uh, assure you that that this pattern will continue, but it probably will. So I think um, maybe tying two of your comments together there, so like a clear different objective function, right? Industry is shareholder value. Academia should be about discovery, although we have a lot of other impact uh, beyond discovery, but that shouldn't be the objective function. And I guess one of the things that occurred to me is even in the throes of, of you know, what's happening in industry and developing these large language models, for example, the objective function of many of these things is next word prediction. <laughs> but they're actually having a lot of broader impact in terms of what they do. I mean, people are not surprised about things where the objective one th function is one thing and it has that outcome and other outcomes. So, you know. Um, I agree. So we basically should be, as you're saying, unabashedly committed to an objective function that's different from industry, but noting that historically those have had lots of other impact beyond the objective a, function. A, a, absolutely. And, 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 and I guess much like your, 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 your daytime business, <laughs> past results don't necessarily predict future outcomes, as the finance folks say about just about everything. But, but we come to believe it because of the... the extent to which they have. Well, I, uh, so today, listening to the, the presentations, um, that um, uh, thoughtful presentations today, uh, you know, one, one takeaway I think we should all have is, is uh, the diversity of ideas people are pursuing. And uh, you know, one thing for sure is that the Quest 
is not a monoculture. They're looking at things uh, from, people are looking at things from many different perspectives. Uh, we heard disagreement among the speakers, which is very healthy. Um, uh, when you look at the, uh, 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 the commercial tech world today, uh, it's not entirely monoculture, but um, the, the number of, of ideas and, and, uh, and uh, you know, let's just call it research directions that they're going into, it's uh, you know, not, not all that broad. Most of the money is going into uh, you know, building large data centers to do more matrix multiplies you know, in a format that is you know, you know, maybe mostly transformer-based architectures. You know, it, it, you know, I'm, I don't want to belittle it. Of course, you know, they do good research at these companies too, but um, there, it's much less, in, uh, I'm, I'm guessing, mu there's much more diversity in, in thinking at a place like MIT than at a place like OpenAI. So you talked about sort of the healthy mix of different views on you know, particular <clears throat> questions among PIs involved in projects in the Quest. Um, so one, one thing I'd like to uh, focus on for a minute here is just uh, you know, the Quest has organized itself in a, in a way that um, is different from much of academia. Academia tends to be PI focused and maybe some collaboration among PIs. The Quest is focusing itself around some key missions that really are multiple, multi-PI and aim to sort of bring those different viewpoints together on common set of questions. So I guess, um, you know, and I guess <laughs> my view as a dean is that's really hard to do <laughs> um, in my experience. So, uh, you know, you've, you've been thinking about and, you know, part of these kinds of problems for a long time, as you said, all the way back to the old AI lab, which really had much more of the, of the PI-driven view of the world. Um, do you have thoughts, advice on how important it is to do this? How, you know, how can we really build structures that support bringing these groups together? You know, most of the structure of academia still is around kind of individual achievement, you know, most agencies are funding individual PIs uh, or collections of PIs without the same kind of focus that we have in the missions. So just your thoughts on that would be really interesting. I, I, I think, uh, uh, you know, it's a good, a good question. I, uh, I think one of the biggest challenges that universities have is that um, the tr tr traditional structures uh, that were uh, uh, aligned, as you said, uh, not only around individual PIs, but also around uh, relatively rigid departmental uh, boundaries um, is, uh, is, is getting a bit out of date. And um, one of the, I think, benefits of the, uh, the college project is, is the push to uh, promote interdisciplinary uh, research, uh, in part driven by dual faculty appointments. Um, MIT has, for years, had uh, various kinds of uh, centers and institutes, and uh, you know, no one really knows exactly what all these overlapping things mean, but it, it doesn't matter so much because uh, the spirit of it is to promote collaboration amongst people that would otherwise not collaborate. Um, I think that, that uh, you, you know, for academic institutions to, thr to thrive, uh, you know, these boundaries and borders need to be broken down even more. And, um, and, and uh, you know, efforts like the Quest are absolutely positively uh, going in that direction. Um, I think that uh, there are challenges, though, because, as you said, Dan, so much of the academic world is kind of built around silos, including to some extent the tenure process, uh, the funding organizations like NSF are, you know, they often think about things in a very, uh, 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 you know, kind of vertically siloed way. Um, but the good news is uh, MIT is leading uh, the world in thinking about more interdisciplinary approaches across the board and you know, I think that you know, uh, as uh, you know, we're we're going to show the world how to do it. So there, I do. I will say a little something about the college. <laughs> Jim said I might. He probably knows me better than I know myself. As I was walking up here, I said I'm not going to say anything about the college. But um, 
but I, I think, you know, David, you've been very involved with things. But first, I would start with just before the College of Computing, um, you know, two departments that uh, ha have been collaborating a lot uh, are BCS and EECS, and this dates back a long time. In fact, even the old AI lab <laughs> back, you know, way in ancient history had, you know, faculty from those two I mean, predecessor to BCS. It didn't exist as a department then, but, uh, but those are two departments where there's a lot of collaboration between faculty, and I think actually CBMM and the Quest have been very important in that over the last sort of 10 plus years uh, of that collaboration. And some of that's educational, right? There are things like this blended major, the 6-9 undergraduate major um, on computation and cognition. So it is, you know, sort of tying the educational and the research realms together in ways that I think, you know, if we can't educate the next generation of people at these interfaces, if we're still kind of educating them completely separately and they have to go through all the you know, pain to work together that the current people at the forefront of the field did were not really advancing in the same way. So, you know, I think that's where the college now is a structure that's not just doing this at the interface of BCS and EECS, but actually the interface of a whole bunch of computational departments is super important. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, I, I was going to make a comment about the uh, CBMM summer school. Um, Todd, you know, it was on my list of questions. Good. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, uh, you know, it's just to follow on to what you said, yeah. um, uh, you know, if you think, uh, you know, the pipeline of of uh, of, of of the youth moving into, uh, you know, ultimately be becoming a faculty at a major research university, how does that pipeline even work? Um, uh, you, you know, even today, I think, you know, when you're, you know, in high school, uh, you know, thinking about the future, you know, you you, you think along. You know, essentially departmental lines because, like in high schools, they have math departments, physics departments. So everything is siloed at a very, um, uh, you know, almost from from the beginning of your education, and uh, and then so that siloing just continues all the way up. So you have someone, uh, you know, who's you know becoming, uh, you know, an MIT undergrad, and you know they want to major in physics, and and so now they're siloed in physics. Um, the uh, CBMM summer school, one of the uh, you know important parts of that program, it was mentioned earlier, is to uh, you know break down the silos and uh, to to show people that uh, you know their pathways, research pathways uh, uh, in particular, that you know cut across everything. Now uh, you know ultimately, if we really want to transform uh, uh, you know this, uh, you know, let's just call it the. Uh, uh, you know the uh, the way society thinks about uh, advancing knowledge. Uh, you know, at the very youngest ages, we have to uh, you know change uh, you know how people start to develop their interests. And uh, you know, I don't have any answers here, but um, I, I think it's very very important that we stop thinking about the world in terms of a set of departments that were created uh, you know more than a hundred years ago. Yep, I couldn't agree more. I think the design space is really tough. Um, there's what I'll call the Starbucks problem, which is like every customer has their own completely personalized drink, uh, which doesn't scale very well, as Starbucks has been sort of wrestling with recently. So, and also, especially at the undergraduate level and even more, you know, high school, kids don't necessarily know what to study and what to combine. But the current departmental structures, I, I think, are much too rigid. So, you know, how do we kind of restructure education uh, to be more flexible at identifying important combinations of disciplines that are really standing to drive advances? Uh, you know, I think um, what's been going on here in the CBM and, and, uh, and, uh, and Quest communities is a very important example of that. And one that I think has, you know, served to help MIT make changes in other areas as well. So it's very important. But, but exactly, you know, even if you just take the current disciplines, like all and choose two pairs, is an awful lot of different disciplinary things to have. But you know, that might not even like maybe you want even a more fine grained mix than that. How do you really make it work? Is really a, it, it, it's it's an intellectual challenge, it is. not just it, an organization. And it will take time as well because uh, you know, you know, long ago, or maybe not that long ago, 
um, uh, interdisciplinary uh, stuff was, you know, almost like, well, I'm not good at this and I'm not good at that, so I'll combine them together. And, um, you know, that, you know, is obviously not a, a healthy way to look at it. So one other thing about the CBMM summer school is, is uh, I think, also very relevant more broadly in education and, and to MIT, uh, which is how do institutions like MIT, uh, you know, share their learning with broader groups of students? Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know if you've, you know, as you said, you spent a little bit of time this last summer there, like whether you saw things there that really sort of struck you that, you know, we ought to be doing more of at MIT, that other institutions ought to be doing more of, or, you know, there was the sort of online only version of this with MOOCs and MITx, and that's great for a certain kind of learner who can sort of learn in a relatively independent fashion. A summer school is exactly the opposite. It's extremely hands-on, so just... Uh, well, well I, you know, what really struck me, uh, uh, having spent some time there, is, again, that it, it, it was not a department. Um, it, 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 you know, you didn't think that you were going to, a, you know, a summer program in math or computer science or physics. Um, there, so you, you, you immediately, at least my response to this was that, um, uh, you know, people are, you know, interacting with a bunch of, uh, you know, brilliant scholars from a wide range of fields in a very harmonious way. And it's just entirely collaborative environment. And everyone who goes through that program, or most people, we, you know, there have been surveys done, you know, they all come out of it with, uh, you know, c inspired that, you know, there are new ways to look at problems. And uh, you, know, you don't really get so much of that in a, a typical academic environment uh, uh, yet. Um, so, I, you know, one thing is, you, you know, some of the learnings of that program need to be imported right back into MIT. Yeah, couldn't, couldn't, couldn't agree more. So, um, are there topics that you wish I had touched on? Well, uh, you know, the one, the, the one, uh, you know, I wanted to go back to um, uh, just a bit, uh, uh, you know, the, the question of... Um, uh, uh, you know, maybe a philosophical question about what is intelligence, um, uh, and you know, uh, you know, the quest for intelligence is a—it's a very interesting name. I think it, it is um, uh, quite appropriate because uh, it's very hard to imagine doing research in something if you don't really know what you're researching. And um, uh, what, so, what I find very interesting about the evolution of AI. Uh, uh, from from when I first got involved with it to where we are today, is that um, uh, we, you know, it, it, it's almost as if you know the more you know, the more you, you know you don't know, or however that expression goes. And uh, so while on the one hand, uh, you know, I feel you know obviously the field has progressed, uh, you know, it's fantastic, right? The Achievements uh, are, you know, you know, they're real, and they're, uh, you know, many of us are, are are really surprised at the rapid progress uh, in the last, uh, you know, uh, you know, under ten years. Um, but on the other hand, a as you begin to look at, uh, uh, you know, what you know current AI systems can do, as you begin to uh, to think a little bit more about uh, what int intelligence might be. Um, I think uh, you, you, you got to conclude that uh, there are so many basic problems that we have to solve that the need to be investing uh, more heavily in, uh, you know, essentially the very, you know, the basic questions uh, is greater than ever. Uh, uh, you, you know, when, uh, in, in, when I arrived at the AI lab in 83, you know, very few people were really thinking about intelligence per se and what it meant. We were, you know, just kind of pursuing things, and now uh, because AI has progressed and is able to do, you know, a range of uh, really unbelievable things, you, you begin to realize that there are some questions, very key questions, that you need to be able to answer to be able to, I think, successfully take the field forward. And I think the quest is set up in such a way to do that. And you know, I definitely believe that 
uh, looking at at the human brain and uh, you know various psychological you know the BCS angle to the whole thing uh, is critical to deliver this kind of understanding. Yeah, when you reflect back on that time when we were both uh, around as graduate students at MIT, uh, you know I think uh, you know as you said there was a a mix of work in both the sort of AI side and and the and the sort of cognition and neuroscience side of things and interaction between those in the same lab there. Um, but nobody understood what we were really working on. Like you had mentioned to anybody who didn't sort of hang out literally on a particular floor of that building in Tech Square and you'd have to spend hours explaining like, you know, what are you even trying to do? Like I remember working on computer vision and people had no idea what, you know, what it even meant. So today, everybody thinks they know what AI is. They think they know what, you know, I don't know if that's a better state of the world or a worse state of the world, because well, people now all have this, you know, they think they know. <laughs> well, I think it's, it's perhaps uh, better in some ways and worse <laughs> in others. The, uh, there's a lot of confusion uh, uh, about uh, AI today. And I think one of the reasons why it's, uh, so confusing to the general public, uh, and in and confusing in ways that are you know maybe not healthy, is that um, AI means almost anything, um, and the uh, reality of it is the uh, the various uh, uh, AI advances that we have uh, you know seen today, um, in, in many cases the algorithms are all different. And you know to say that there's like a you know I think the general public may may think and 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 you know even you know leadership in Washington and elsewhere that there's like the AI algorithm, and um, which is just not healthy. I mean there isn't an AI algorithm. There you know there are ANNs. There's you know transform. I mean there are countless different AI algorithms. Um, another unhealthy thing that has occurred in the field. Is that um, uh, you know there are different kinds of AI. There's uh, you know AI being uh, you know essentially AI for prediction. There's generative AI. There are different sorts of applications, and so when you start to and, and each of them you know have uh, you know different states of advancement. So if you think about using uh, you know I, I mean I hate to use I I almost now don't like to say AI because I feel like I'm you know promoting uh, you know, confusion. But if you're using, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, a, a, an ANN to make a weather prediction, okay, that that's fine, and you know, you can validate whether or not the forecasts are better. But some people start to use these things to make predictions that you know maybe the st the the actual statistics behind them are are not valid, and so it's quite easy uh, for people to end up. Do, doing things with the technologies that are being invented to not necessarily be so scientifically sound. And so it would help, in my opinion, if people, but you know, I've been saying this and no one's paying attention, if, if people would stop just talking about AI in the most general sense and be a little bit more precise about what they're talking about, and then that would al uh, allow it to have a maybe a more cogent conversation about well how what you know what are, how advanced has it become in that area, and that might uh, you know be be just generally healthier for the world. Well, great. Um, thank you. Uh, it's been great having a conversation with you. I don't know, Jim. Uh, we, I didn't ask at the beginning. Were we going to have any uh, questions from the group, or should we turn it to you? I'm, I'm happy to take a question or two. Sure. I think uh, if someone has a mic. Or I could give up my mic. <laughs> oh, I see. We were using the question mics. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Tommy. So the summer school, when we started it at CBMM, was uh, thought as um, a real opportunity to uh, distribute and mutate ideas. 
ideas are you know, part of our technology and cultures. They are like meme, they're like genes, they're memes, according to Dawkins. And the characteristic like, uh, like genes is the one that they replicate and mutate. And schools, universities, classrooms, libraries are ideal place for them, right? And so at the summer school, we try to do that, as you said, to break barriers, just to stimulate more ideas, mutations of current ideas, more powerful mm -hmm. viruses of the mind. Uh, part of that was also trying to in include people outside MIT, not only different departments, but people from Harvard, for instance. Question is, should we try to that to do that in the future. You know, I can see this as a way to get MIT and Harvard together, which I personally think would be, would be good. Well, I, the, uh, the, uh, the, the power of uh, the academic world is its ability to bring together uh, diverse thinkers. And uh, uh, very, you know, uh, Industry in general is going to be a closed world, and uh, uh, the you know industry was a little bit more open uh, with their AI research until they discovered that now they have to make money quickly, and so it's become a much more a closed system. Uh, I think we have to work to fill the gaps, and uh, the kind of problems that uh, universities need to solve, not just AI, but climate, you name it, uh, requires increased academic collaboration across the board. Uh, you know, one thing that always uh, uh, I found interesting is that universities are actually really competitive with each other and often don't want to um, share. Uh, and you know, I don't think that that's the right way to look at it. So I, I fully agree with you, Tommy. So we've been talking about collaboration between departments and, and um, how the, um, you know, like there's a big synergy between six, six and nine in terms of um, the two different ways of trying to produce intelligence. Now one of the, one of the things in intelligence that I think Jim mentioned particularly is is the parts of the brain that are useful for interacting with with other people in order to produce essentially a society that has its own intelligence at a higher level um, I'm thinking of like course 17 and maybe course 15 a little bit and um, is the organizational so so the question is should we be interacting in that way and is the organization of the brain into into a mind similar in any way to the organization of minds into a society or or an organization <laughs> well i mean it's a great question which uh, I, I i certainly can't answer that question the um you know you know i i would i, I would say that um uh, when, when, when you know, not directly related to your question, but when when you think about when I think about um, uh, in, intelligence, um, you know, I'm always thinking about uh, you know an optimization function, like what problem are you actually trying to solve, and um, I, I think it's kind of you know, look, people I'm sure will, would debate me, but um, I think actually, Jim, you said that uh, you know our, our you know we evolved. You know, essentially, to survive and reproduce, and you know that's that's like the utility function that um, you, you, you know evolution was following. I think depending on who you bring together to collaborate uh, within a university, that will uh, and, and what the utility function is, um, that will uh, you know change the output of a university. I think AI systems themselves today are are are, are somewhat crippled by the fact that. You know, no one can agree, uh, in fact, what 
they're trying to optimize for. Um, so I, I think one of the uh, you know perhaps unpleasant surprises that will occur with certain kinds of uh, you know for example take a large language model um, uh, you know that approach a transformer based approach um, you know so we, we all know it's it's essentially predicting the next word but you know based upon what and um, uh, you know so uh, you know one of the shortcomings people point out is that. Uh, you know, it's sort of, in a way, predicting the next word based upon what sort of the average uh, point of view represented in the training data, you know, rather than necessarily trying to predict something interesting. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, I'm, I'm kind of wandering around a bit, but, but the point, I think, is that, you know, sort of the models, uh, you know, you, you know th that you're trying to optimize for matter quite a bit both for output from a university, output from an AI model. Uh, we should think about it in terms of, you know, what's the optimization? And I guess one last comment on that, I would say, you know, the college is working with every one of those departments you just mentioned. The question of whether those departments have faculty in them or interests in collaborating on intelligence is something that has to be driven out of the departments as well as out of something like the Quest. This is always a marriage. Um, that's just sort of the way everything works in order to, you know, have people really stay collaborating with one another. But David, thank you. Great talking. Thank you, Dan.